What is up guys? Namibia is almost over and that is crazy. It seems to have just flown by. We have been so, so busy. We um, have two, a couple more game drives left. Two more game drives left. And so I don't want to film well game driving because it's hard. It's hard not to disturb the animals, it's hard not to disturb the participants, and I'm teaching on this, uh, this workshop, obviously. So instead I kind of want to talk about my approach to wildlife photography on safari, because the approach on safari when you're in your own vehicle or on a safari vehicle is very, very different to like a professional wildlife photographer. A professional wildlife photographer is probably out on their own or out with an assistant. They're probably in a hide or at least moving around in a way that gets them kind of almost more hidden shots. We're very much exposed. We're kind of like the caged people, whereas the animals are roaming around free. So the approach, I think, when you're on safari is way, way different than a professional wildlife photographer. So we're gonna go out on this sunset safari. I'm gonna talk a lot after that about my approach and things that went through my head and things I was looking for. So and here's some B-roll of some safari stuff. Wildlife photography isn't about the photography. It's about the animals. A world-renowned wildlife photographer once said to me, I don't really love photography. I love animals. I love nature. Photography is simply my means of preserving nature. Photography is my method of argument. Because if people see these beautiful animals in my photos, they have to be moved enough to protect them. To me, wildlife photography is about conservation. I couldn't agree more. But when you're there in that safari vehicle, wildlife photography is about being humbled too. There are few places in the world where one feels more vulnerable than steps away from a 15 foot tall giraffe, or rolling beside cackling hyenas on the prowl, or feet from the eyes of a house-sized elephant. Wildlife photography is about realizing how small you are in this world and appreciating it. It's not about feeling weak though. It's not about feeling useless or hopeless. It's about understanding that the world is bigger than us. And it's about being okay with that. There's nothing like being on safari. There are few places in the world I'd rather be than sat on the savannas of Africa staring out to the flats and brush, surrounded by the potential of something incredible happening. Whether it's as simple as spotting a beautiful steenbok or as intense as being charged by a black rhino, Shit. Okay, it's okay. But I got it in 4K. There's rarely a day on safari where you don't have a unique experience. That's enough B-roll of the animals. Namibia is unbelievable and we had such a good time in Atosha. It was just phenomenal. We didn't see a leopard, but aside from that, we just had so many crazy encounters and I wish I could have vlogged that, but when you have a big group like I did, you can't, well, you can't vlog it. And so I'm sorry I couldn't vlog properly in Atosha, but we had so many epic sightings. We saw a bunch of rhinos both day and night. We saw mating lions both day and night. We saw a honey badger. We saw giraffes, elephants. We even saw a car get charged by an elephant. We even ourselves, in our safari vehicle got charged by a rhino, by a black rhino. We saw like 10 black rhinos on this trip. It was crazy. Anyways, we're back in Windshook now. I've never been so dirty in my life. My jeans are just dirty. They, they are just, they're ripped to pieces, not because I was attacked by a lion, but because somebody tricked me into buying the style ones. And yeah, dirty and tired, exhausted even, and never happier. It's just been amazing here in Namibia. So I wanna talk about my photography approach to wildlife while on safari. Because I'm not a wildlife photographer, I think my approach is totally untrained. It might even be totally wrong. I'm, I've never had a photography lesson in wildlife photography. I don't think I've even watched a lesson on wildlife photography on YouTube or anything. I've never read a book on wildlife photography. I kind of just go with my own, I guess my own vision for wildlife photography. And it might be wrong, but it's kind of what I look for. So I kind of want to walk you through my approach and talk about some of the things that I look for when photographing wildlife. And I'm gonna support this with a little bit of B-roll on top of this and uh, the photos I took as well. And when I show the photos, I'm also gonna show Lightroom so that you can see what kind of editing I did to it. And you'll see that I almost edit every single animal image exactly the same. So I have 
all of the information on my phone, all the things, the ideas, the thoughts I wrote down. The first part of my approach to wildlife photography is that I rarely photograph the entire animal. I find that when I'm trying to photograph the entire animal, I kind of lose the story or I get so focused on photographing the whole animal that I kind of cage the animal. And what I mean by caging the animal is there's too tight of a crop and there's no dead space for the animal to move or the story of the animal to move. So I really, really rarely photograph an entire animal. So often I have the opportunity to and I'll just crop off half of the animal and photograph with a little bit of dead space. And one of the important things is you can't just crop off a little part of the animal. You have to crop off like half or three quarters, otherwise it looks like it was an accident. But if you use it in a way that enhances the story or adds some mystery to the story, it can really work, I feel. And kind of continuing on that, I like to leave a lot of dead space in my wildlife photography images. So when I'm photographing animals, wildlife, I try to find the animal, but also a background that I can leave empty on. I want a nice clean background. And the reason I do that is for two reasons, really. The first is because I need to kind of feel like that animal has room to run. I don't want to kill their story. I want to enhance it. I want the viewer of the image to look at the image, see the animal, and then think they can move into that part of the frame. And the second reason is because I try to sell photos. That's my job. I try to sell photos. And advertisers so often need dead space in the images. If you're selling fine art photography, it's okay to have, you know, the whole image totally consumed by the animal or animals. But if you're in the business of selling photos for advertising, commercial, or even advertorial, or even editorial, you need space for words. You need space for that marketing to go. So if South African Airlines starts a route to Namibia and they want to advertise that, they can buy an image that has all that dead space and they can put things like their prices, they can put their logo, they can put their terms and conditions. There's room for them to advertise. The dead space is really important for that reason. The next thing I like to do is incorporating the landscape. I'm a big fan of wildlife photography that shows the scale of the landscape around it. When you're in Patagonia, Wanako in front of the mountains in the background, or here we got some oryx in front of the dunes in Sosisvlei. It just enhances the story again. It helps tell the story of the landscape. It helps show how big the landscape is. And it shows the animal and the type of environments they live in. And I think that's so important. So. Oftentimes, I'll see an animal somewhere and I'll be like, how can I incorporate this landscape? And I'll drive a long way around to try to get the right angle on the landscape. So it's something I definitely look for. I think about the landscape almost as much as I think about the animal sometimes. Another thing I do is I look for light. Wildlife photography is as much about the light as it is the animal. I look for heavy backlight so I can get this key light around the animal. I look for soft light through clouds so I can incorporate the sky. I look for light, again, as much as I look for the animal. There'll be times that I'll drive past a herd of springbok or impala or wildebeest and not photograph them. And there'll be times that I sit there for a half an hour with some zebra just because the light was good. And that happened lots here on the trip in Atosha. We'd go by Springbok or Wildebeest and the light would be bad so we'd just keep driving. And then there'd be other times that the light was better so we'd photograph them. The light is so, so important. In fact, I don't think I took a single wildebeest photo the entire time we were in Atosha just because I didn't see one with good light. So for me, the light's really important and I'm constantly looking for light. I'm also looking for things to bokeh things to blur out, both in the foreground and the background. My approach to all types of photography, whether it's landscape, travel, street photography, architecture, or wildlife photography, my approach is depth. I really like to create depth. I find that creating that depth gives scale and dimension to the image. It gives a 3D quality to the image rather than just a flat looking image. So again, 
There might be times that I'll drive right by a bunch of zebra because there's nothing in the foreground, nothing in the background. There's nothing to show the scale and the depth. And there's other times that I'll find some grass in the foreground or the background and I can create that blur both in the foreground and background and really show the depth to the image. I shoot a lot of my wildlife photography at really low apertures at f4, 5.6 because I really like that blurred out look in both the foreground and the background. I love images, for example, of elephants that have a lot of grass in the bottom and you just see the elephant sticking out of the top. I, I just really like that. I think it's a way of showing depth and I think it's a way of making your images look less like a snapshot and more like a made image. And the last thing is I really like to look for the eyes of the animal. Just like people, you need the eyes to show the emotion. It'd be rare that you would take a portrait of a person and not capture their eyes. So with wildlife, I don't think it's any different. So I'm constantly looking for ways to get the eyes into the important part of the frame. I'll do two things with the eyes. I'll either try to put them at the two-thirds mark of the image, or sometimes what I really like to do is put the dominant eye smack dab in the middle of the frame. I think when that dominant eye of an animal is right in the middle of the frame, it can really show a lot of power and emotion in the image. So I, that's my approach. I think that's it wrapped up pretty quick. And I've said all this about the safari, about being on safari. And the reason that this is my approach on safari is because you don't have control. You can't get out of your vehicle on safari. You can't track animals on safari. You can't set up a photo blind on safari. You really can't even track animal behavior on a safari. You're literally at the whims of nature. And so you can't plan things out. You really kind of have to wing it. And I think that my way of winging it, Natosha kind of worked. I'm quite happy with at least five of the images I shot there. And I'm quite happy with some of the Oryx photos I took in Sosisley. And overall, I think my wildlife photography from five years ago, the first time I came to Namibia to now, is leaps and bounds better. And I'm really excited about that. And I'm really excited for the next chapter when we get back to South Africa and we get to do more wildlife photography in places like Kruger National Park, Kalahari National Park, and elsewhere. So stay tuned to the channel. Tomorrow, Jody and I are driving all the way back to Cape Town. We're gonna break it up into two days probably, but we're driving all the way back to Cape Town. And then I'm gonna do a roundup video from Namibia where I show and share all my favorite photo locations all over the country. I'm just gonna round it up and show you where I made every single one of my favorite photos, not just on this trip, but the three previous times I came here as well. So stay tuned for that, it should be fun, and I'll see you guys there. Peace.